Welcome to the YouTube channel for Bible Biker Church in Rockwood, Tennessee. I am Fred Marshall, Elder and Associate Pastor. We pray that what you're about to see is inspiring to you as it is the truth in the Word of God as it is written. We pray that it blesses you and anyone that you share it with. If you like what you see, please click on the like button and subscribe to our channel. Also know that you can find us on Facebook under the page name Bible Biker Church. Thanks and have a blessed day. All right, we finally got uh, some of our stuff back there working. Uh, apparently, uh, Brother Greg's pretty smart. He's figured it out. So, uh, Brother Fred's not with us this morning, so uh, we're, we're, we're kind of struggling with some of our sound stuff and, uh, and trying to get everything to work. But uh, I would like to take the time to, uh, to thank everybody that, uh, that brought up uh, doing Sunday schools here in the morning because I've noticed uh, every week it carries with me all week long the stuff that we're learning uh, in Sunday school. I, I just recall myself uh, thinking about it throughout the week and uh, it's something that in my past I didn't retain it as well as it seems like I'm retaining it now but that goes all the way back to if you ask God for wisdom he'll give it to you abundantly and uh, God's word says that uh, he don't give you things because you deserve it. He gives you things because he wants you to have it. And that's amazing that we can uh, serve a God that wants us to have things even though we know we don't deserve it. Yes. So uh, what we're going to try to do today is we're going to get our uh, uh, brother, uh, brother Fred did pick us out some songs and try to get us set up for today. So we're going to uh, we're going to try to see if we can make that work. Don't know what they are. I'm just a surprise of y'all. <laughs> Let me invite you to stand. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha! 
single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. <laughs> At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love. The very same love is pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts, and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all. It's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. Amen. 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 A couple quick things before we uh, have our chopper church. Uh, one of the things that they say is this is not our church, it's His. And uh, who did Jesus sit with and, uh, and, 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 and talk with at the, at the big fancy dinners that they had with all the Pharisees? Uh, did He sit with the uh, high body church figures? No. Or did He sit with the publicans? The ones, the ones that were out there, yeah, the heathens, plebeians, the what? Plebeians. Plebeians. Yes. Okay. Called him wrong. Okay. So what, what, what this is saying is, you know, this is not our church; it's his. So if we allow Jesus to still have his way today, <coughs> and it'd be just like what we preach that everybody comes to that door is welcome, yeah. because Jesus has set some. <coughs> The way they are. So who are we to change that? Uh, one of the things I'd like to do this morning is uh, I received a father's love letter today, as, as most of us did, and uh, it's, it's very fitting today to, to read that uh, to the church because today being Veterans Day, uh, one of the most important things to a veteran, one of the most important things to a soldier, a sailor, an airman, or a troop is uh, to receive letters from home when they're overseas. When I was deployed overseas, one of the most important things that could change the whole tone of what was going on during the day is mail call. And to receive a letter from someone who loved you, very important to us. I know that uh, one time we, for three months we were out deployed. Uh, they had a little uh, civil war going on in Liberia. And this was before we left for uh, Desert Storm. And uh, during that time, we were there to evacuate the embassy and uh, to, uh, to keep people safe. For that three months, we didn't receive any mail. We didn't receive any, any word from home. And uh, this is a ship full of people with families back home, kids, uh, people that, that had kids being born that didn't even get to uh, have letters from home to tell them how things went. And this just sets the tone for what it's like for a lot of veterans out there. Uh, we've had uh, situations to where, uh, you know, they carry the mail in in a big uh, cargo net put to the bottom of helicopters. We've had times where they've, uh, those that have come apart and lost all the mail in the ocean. And to go for three months without mail and you work with the people that you work with all day, and at the end of the day, or at the end of the night, we have night shift and day shift. It's 24-7 operations out there. There's no holidays. There's no birthday time off. Uh, if you call in sick, you've got to be sick enough to be laid up in a hospital bed, or you get what you get, and you go on back to work. Now, uh, during this time, we also we had brought on all the refugees that we evacuated from the embassy, 
and uh, they had to sleep in our area. They call it a birthing area where uh, people live on the ship. And our place that we lived on the ship was called Medical Overflow Birthing Area. And we had an upstairs which was the night shift and a downstairs which was the day shift. Oh no, the, yeah, the upstairs was uh, where our night shift stayed. Day shift was where our, uh, uh, the second deck was. Well, we brought all the refugees out. They uh, put them in medical overflow. So as I would be getting off from work, I'd go tap the guy that was in the, the bed that I slept in and say, hey man, it's time for you to go to work. He'd get up and go to work and I'd get in that bed. They called it hot seat and racks is what they called it. But that was how we lived. And with all that going on and not getting any mail from the outside world, we were at each other's throats. People wanted to kill each other. I mean, they just hated each other. But by the time that first helicopter arrived with our mail, and mail was given out, everybody was so happy just to hear from home. There was a lot of hugging necks going on, and it went from where we despised the people that we lived with and worked with every day, and it went to where we were just happy to see each other because we got information from back home. So, with that being said, and today being Veterans Day, if you if you have a loved one that's overseas, or if you know of anybody that's overseas, neighbors or, or whatever, give them a little information from home. It's very important to them to at least feel like they're part of America, even if they're not living in America while they're fighting for it. Okay, do we have any veterans up there today? Just you. <laughs> I'm only one. And I'm already standing, so. Uh, what I'd like to do before I read this is I'd like to have a moment of silent prayer for the uh, for the ones that we have that are still fighting for us. The ones that are home that are still fighting a battle inside. Because when you get done over there, you know where you stand over there. You know where your enemy's at over there. And you know what kind of work tempo that you're going to have over there. But when you get home, things change. There's no jobs for you. You have to try to get in the market. And then when you do get in the market for the jobs, you have people that, that complain about you having any kind of seniority because of your government experience or you know your uh, military experience and all because they said you weren't there at the job long enough to have any kind of seniority like on government jobs and everything and they, they, they kind of hold it against you that you come in with any kind of seniority from where you've been and the, the, the answer for that is well you volunteered to go over there so you shouldn't have anything when you get back here that's that's what we're that's what we're faced with, with a lot of places and one of the things, that, and, and I know I'm not complaining about the civilian world or anything, I'm just telling you what we face when we come back home. To come back home and apply for a job to support your family and find out that they've got translators there for people who don't speak English, and every one of those get hired, and you're told that you're too qualified to have the job, you need to go on back home. I mean, this is what we face. This is what goes on. And this is what I think that we can do when we're trying to change America to, to do things for them. And like I said, it's not to belittle anybody uh, that did not go overseas, that did not join the military. It's not because I love you guys for, for being here to keep things going while we're over there. But just to get in the mindset to know that when we came home, especially Vietnam veterans, they, they had it worse than anybody I can ever think of. But when we get home, we face all new struggles and we don't that's why they say that we don't we don't play well with others we don't get along with society we actually have to go through school just to learn how to get back in society to try to blend well and that doesn't always work because like I said we have people that lost their lives overseas we have people that lost their friends overseas and when they come back part of their lives are gone and families don't even understand it because we have different families while we're over there I don't want to make the whole message about that I just want to set the tone for our moment of silent prayer to know what we're praying for over there before I read this letter. So we'll take a moment for silent prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for everything that you've done for us, Lord. And we just thank you for the people that are over there fighting for our freedom. Father God, we just thank you for the ones that have gone before us and fought for our freedom. And Lord, we thank you for the ones that, that have not that didn't get to come back home, Lord, we just thank you for their ultimate sacrifice, Father God, and we thank you for the sacrifices made by the ones that are coming home, for the ones that are willing to do it in the future, Father God. We just pray that you'll look over them and protect them, and we thank you, Lord, and we thank them for honoring our freedom, Father God. 
In Jesus' name, we pray that you'll be with each and every one of us. Amen. Amen. Okay. Like I said, I, I thank each and every one of y'all for supporting what we're doing in ministry here, too, because it's like Brother Gene says, and Brother Gene's not here, but we are in Jesus' special forces uh, to get out there and do what God has called us to do, too. So uh, if you didn't serve in the military, I respect each and every one of you the same because we are serving God, and we are in the trenches out there trying to go out and reach the people that most people consider to be the unreached. And we're going to reach them. Uh, so I'm going to read this letter here uh, that was given to us by one of our beautiful young ladies. Uh, and she was very happy to do that. This is a father's love letter, an intimate message from God to you. It says, my child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down, when you rise up, I'm familiar with all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered, for you were made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being. For you are my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You are not a mistake, for all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I have been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but I am the complete expression of love, and it is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand, for I am your provider and I meet all your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts towards you are countless as the sand on the seashore, and I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you, for you are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul and I want to show you a great and marvelous things, or show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me, and I will give you the desires of your heart. For it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine. For I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are broken hearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I will take all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your Father. I love you even as I love my Son, Jesus. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. That's very important. He's not counting our sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I loved that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you will receive me, and nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father, and I will always be father. My question is, Will you be my child? I am waiting for you. Love your dad, Almighty God. Amen. Amen. Every pause that I took in that from every sentence is backed up by scripture from that that I read. If you don't see the paper, look at it because everything that I read, every pause was a pause for where there was scripture in there to back up everything that was said on that. We thank you for that letter. And I, I hope there are veterans out there to get to receive that letter and know deepest, darkest nights of anybody's life there is light and we are that light and anybody that receives Jesus can be that light for someone else okay I'd like to go ahead and uh, dismiss the children and while we're doing that uh, I, I just like to say in, in joking that I think brother Greg might have just let some of that stuff kind of not work together so well so that Brother Fred will know how much we need him here and how much we're missing. So anybody that will, just turn around and wave at the camera and say, we love you, Brother Fred. We love, love you, Fred. Fred. 
we'd, we'd like to see you back here Sunday. I know that's where I know this is where you love to be today, but you can't be out of town doing what you need to do and be be here at the same time. But we do want him to know he's loved and he's missed. Okay, what we're going to be reading today is uh, it's the same thing that we started off in uh, Bible study Sunday. So if you weren't here for Bible study, you can kind of get to see what what we do because. Ever since uh, we started the Bible study on Thursday, I know Brother Dave was here, and uh, we just, uh, it's just been weighing on my heart to cover the first three verses of what we read in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. It'll be the first three verses. But I know that every Sunday, it, it seems like just about every Sunday, I always mention that we all have the same measure of faith given to us. And I always say look it up and don't take my word for it. But since we're talking about faith today, I'm going to go ahead and read that today for you, for those of you who have not had the opportunity to look it up. Uh, while, you're, uh, while you're getting your other place in the Bible, I'm going to go ahead and read out of uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 3 right quick while you do that. It is, uh, For I say through the grace given unto me, and we all know that grace is love, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. We're not any higher than anybody else here, regardless of what they do. When we leave out of this church and we're out there on that sidewalk, we're the same as the people who are walking that sidewalk that's never been to church a day in their life. We're the same to God. It says, uh, but to think soberly. And to think soberly also, I would, I would think in my heart that that means, you know, be humble. Think about what you're doing when you're out there. You're not over anybody. The works that you do are not more important than anything anybody else does to God. What you do is important to you to retain your relationship with God, your personal relationship with God. But it says, according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. And I wish in this day and time, the word the in there, I wish in this day and time it would be capitalized to understand that I don't have a quarter of an ounce of a measure, and Brother Dave have a half ounce of a measure, and, you know, Sister Joan have one whole cup of a measure. It's the measure. That means we all have the same. And we talk about it all the time that, uh, then Brother Will, how come some people can talk to God and know what's going to happen better than I do? It was the same way some people can pick up a 20 pound weight and keep curling it in each arm and their arms get bigger and bigger than my arms. They exercise that faith. Okay, and one of the things, I mean, I, I know the children's not here, but I can even break this down to a level of a, uh, that a child could understand it, which that means I could understand it for one, for one time. But when we talk about faith, I'll read the first verse out of uh, Hebrews chapter 11. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So let me break it all the way down to a child's understanding. I really want to see The Incredibles Part 2. And I know it came out on DVD this week. So I know it's out there for me to be able to go have it. So I go to the Red Box. And it ain't the, it, 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 it's there, or it was there, but it's rented out. But see, I know it's there. I know it's going to be there. But it just ain't there at this particular time. So I'm thinking today if I go by there, it might be in there because it's supposed to be in that red box if somebody don't already have it rented out. But guess what's going to happen if it's not there? I'll go back another day and see if it's there again. Eventually, it's going to be there for me to rent it. That's how our faith works. We know we know what's there is there. But just like with, with faith, when you're expecting God to work in your life, you're going to show up saying, God's going to work in my life. But it might just not be today. Amen. You know, God works in our lives every day, but one particular thing that you may want God to do for you may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. But as our faith tells us, we know it's going to be there in God's time. 
We can't pull God. We can't push God. We can't drag God. We can't sway God. We can't even talk to God in a way to make Him change His mind other than change the way we are when we accept Jesus in our heart. Because you're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. We don't change God's mind on that. We accept what God told us from the beginning. God is God. We don't control God. God does not control us. God gives us a choice. And through our faith, we know that choice is there. And we choose to follow because we know what's at the end. We know heaven is there. Just like that DVD I talked about, written, you know, which might have been a little bit silly to talk about at first, but like I said, I like to break things down where I know I can understand it. Because I know if I understand it, everybody can understand it. But you know, today could be the day that our heavenly home is there for us to, to move into. Yeah. We never know that. That's why it's important for us to go around and take that faith. Because you know what? That same measure of faith that we all have to go out and disciple for God because we know that's, that Jesus is, is, is real. We know that Jesus told us to go out and be disciples. We know that, that we are to go out and minister to others because we know what's waiting for us. We know what salvation is. And we know that if we don't believe, we don't have that heavenly home. Is that why it's important for us to tell? One of the things that I wrote down today that, uh, that was on the uh, board here when we were doing our Sunday school lesson, uh, it was, uh, he said, stay ready. It's important to stay ready, but how do we stay ready as a ministry? How do we stay ready for when Jesus comes back or for when God takes us home? The way we stay ready is that we stay busy. Because what happens when we're not busy? What happens if we're playing it safe? What happens if we're sitting back and not doing any work for God? What happens? We get that attacking us every day, telling us, you better play it safe. You better keep playing it safe. Don't get out there and mix with that world. They'll overcome you. But you know, if you're not constantly working for God, that world, that world will overcome you. You don't see God's miracles out there if you're not out there talking to others. You don't see God's miracles out there if you're not dealing with the public. The only thing you see is what, what the devil wants us to believe is that we are to come into this church and stay safe. And if anybody wants to find God, they'll come to the church doors and we'll invite them in. It, it does happen because when I get to my lowest of lows, I know I needed to go find God. And in my mind, I would think that God, the place to find God was, was in, in the building where people gathered for church. In the building where people gathered for church is where iron is supposed to sharpen iron. Amen. God can be found anywhere. Amen. Case in point, one of the people that Brother Friend and I ministered to got saved right there using his motorcycle for an altar out in the parking lot of a bar. I talk about that a lot. That's very important for me. We have someone in here today that the first time we ever had someone come up to the altar to be saved, they're in here with us today. And it was awesome. It's an awesome feeling. It's a feeling that we should celebrate and know that we are to go out and tell people that God is everywhere. And God is there waiting for them. And they have a home to come to within our church, which our church is everywhere we go. But home is where the safety is in here, so we can recharge without the worldly distractions that are going on out there. That's why it's important to know that iron sharpens iron. You can't sharpen iron with brass. You can cut brass with iron, though. You know, this is our sword. Our Bible is our sword. The things that we do in Christ's name is rewards that we receive in heaven. That's why we don't have to go out and brag to people, go on, tell them, everybody that, yeah, we, we, we do everything that we can at church to, to bring people in there and explain to people what all goes on. Don't do it in a bragging way. Do it in a way to show where people will be accepted because if you brag about what you do, other people that come in that don't see it the day that they're there are thinking, it's not happening because I'm here. Right. Because I don't belong here. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Yeah. 
We also got to be careful about what we we'll brag about sometimes. We can give our praises to God and give our praise reports on something that God's done in our life, but don't do it in a bragging way because at that time you're saying that somebody else is going through that same trial that you just went through and they're going to say, God's not doing that for me. I'm not as important as him. You see, we have a great responsibility to God when we're doing God's work. And our responsibility to God is to not think of ourselves any greater than anybody else. Because we know in God's work that it says it's not our works that gets us where we need to be. It's our faith. And through our faith, we believe that God can heal others. We believe that God can, cut, can, can put Jesus in the hearts of everybody that's out there. That's our faith. Our faith enough to walk up to someone and tell them about Jesus. If you don't have faith, you can't do that. Why can't you do that? Because the devil's going to tell me the whole time that person don't want to hear it, that person's going to cuss me out, or that person's just going to plain turn their nose up at me and walk away. But see, here's the thing. If the person turns their nose up to you and walks away, we already have our reward in heaven waiting for us for doing just what God called us to do. That's right. Because we tried. We went out there and done God's work. And believe it or not, that person that turned their nose up, that seed's already planted. That person that turns their nose up will walk away. The same trials that you're going to go through when you receive Christ in your heart or when you go out and do something for, for Jesus, or when you're doing out when you're going out doing God's work and you become under attack for the devil because something good happened to you and that devil wants to attack you to bring you back down, that person you tell about God that turns their nose up and walk away, they're gonna go through that same trial. And that seed that you planted is gonna let them know, hey, I need to think about what that uh, Christian person was telling me about. Because right now all these trials that I'm going through they can be overcome if I have Jesus in my heart. If I don't have Jesus in my heart, I'm going to be overcome. So see, that's why we don't put ourselves above anybody else because they're going through the same trials. It's just the fact that no one has went and told them that you've got the same amount of faith I've got. All you got to do now is just overcome it. That's right. How do we overcome it? We give it to God and we let God overcome it for us. Exercise. Exactly. So one of the things I want to talk about is uh, our children. Our children, a child can have more faith than any adult because they've not been corrupted by the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, now this, this is real important what I want to tell you, and, and we need to understand this. Okay, we've got holidays coming up. I'm not telling everybody go out and tell your kids there's no such thing as saying I'm not trying to get involved in your relationship with your children or between your relationship with you and God. I'm just going to tell you, you know, a lot of times uh, with the holidays that come up that are important to, to learn about what Jesus has done for us, most kids only understand Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, and things like that. And why does that have anything to do with faith? Because we allow our kids to believe in something that is not there and let them believe in that and at some point of their life they're going to find out that that's not true. No. What we told them is not true. But you're also, yes, we're setting them up for failure because we also, as Christians, are telling our children that there's a Jesus, there's a God, let's read the Bible stories. And oh, by the way, the same thing I told you about the Santa Claus and the same thing I told you about the Easter Bunny, they're not really real. Right. I was just telling you that to let you believe it. So that corrupts a child believing what we as adults tell them. So what are they going to think about this Jesus guy that we were talking about? Right. Santa Claus brought him presents. So they really want to believe in him. What we fail with in teaching our children, though, is we get to go home one day a year, Santa Claus brings us presents and puts them under the trees, and we get to rejoice in the fact that we got toys. But every Sunday, you get drugged to church and have to sit in church and learn these Bible stories. What do I get out of that? That's a child's way of thinking. 
we're not explaining to people the gift, the sacrifice that was given to us. Now, am I saying every parent go out there and tell your kids Santa Claus don't exist? And well, now that's going to kind of destroy them too if we go to them in that way. Yeah. What we need to do is we need to teach our kids the importance, the importance of what we teach them that's out there for them, for their salvation. Because I'm sorry, but once a, once a child, and Brother Dave, you can kind of help me out with this or anybody that knows any better, once a child gets to a point where they know what's going on, it's our job as parents to tell them about Jesus dying for our sins and, and, and have them receive that salvation. Because you don't just turn 18 and all of a sudden you got to be saved or you ain't going to go to heaven. You get to where you know what's going on and if you ain't saved, you ain't going to heaven. So why do we teach our kids or why do we set our kids up for failure? I didn't know anything about Jesus or God for a long time in my life. It was well after I stopped believing in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, but I still pretended I believed just so I could get the gifts. So people out there that don't know God or people out there that don't know Jesus is going to say, here's that church cult telling me how to raise my child. It's not our job to attack a child's beliefs and tell them what's not true. It's our job to explain to the parents how important it is for a child to be able to trust what we say as adults. Now this is a very touchy thing for me to even get up and talk about because there's so many times that we're swayed into our beliefs by what somebody else says. you got to pray on that on your own. You've got, you know that personal relationship that you have with God? You need to have a personal relationship with your kids too. Because they need us. We are their example. You know, my daughter, she's not here today because she's got car trouble. And she can't make it here today. But we're working on getting it fixed. But see, the thing that she can tell you is when I raised my daughter, I raised her to know that I was at least a good enough alcoholic where I didn't beat her after I got drunk. But you know, the one thing that they always knew is that Right about that fourth or fifth beer, it's time to hit me up for what they want. Because I'm in such a good mood, I give it to them when I'm, you know. Yeah, you can, I know you're on restriction, but yeah, you can go out with your friends to the skating center or something like that. They knew to watch that beer intake. And they knew that once I got a certain amount of beer in me, not to not to push it because uh, they're liable to do it, and I forget about it by the next day and get on to them for breaking that restriction. You see what I'm saying? That's not a good example set for your kids. A good example to set for your kids is to be the type of parent when a kid can look at you and respect you enough to take what you say for granted instead of only respecting you when you got that alcohol in you and they can get their way. Yeah. We have a very important job, not only as parents but as Christians, because these new uh, a, a new child of God could be 90 years old. And they're a baby in Christ's eyes. That might be closer to getting where we want to go, but there's still a baby in Christ's eyes, and it's still our job to teach them. <clears throat> yeah, I've always felt like an elder of the church doesn't have to be the oldest person in church. It could be the, one of the experienced Christians in the church, which could be a very young man, way younger than me. Here's another thing about faith. In chapter 2, on faith for it, for by it, the elders obtained a good report. Remember what I said, elder don't just mean the oldest person in church. Elder means the experienced people in church. Mm -hmm. They received a good report for having that faith and showing that faith to other people. Because we inspire people to believe. We inspire people to see our faith and have their own faith so that they can exercise that faith. In chapter 3, through faith we understand that the words were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Here's where I'm going to go back to another cartoon for you. I thought about this during Bible study, and you know, it's one of them things like a Star Trek type thing or something like that, where you sit there and you see them producing clones of people through a uh, through like a conveyor belt. 
You know, you got one guy sitting here creating these clones and it's, it's got this lifeless body lay on a conveyor belt and going through all these things and when they come out, they can walk and talk and do all these things. See, we don't see how the human body is formed. I mean, we can get all these medical journals and we can look through all this stuff on how babies form and how a baby grows in the womb, but we're still missing that point of faith of knowing that that baby that's formed in the womb is going to come out. Mm -hmm. So see, God's not sitting over there to the side where we can all go up and say, hey, God's going to create another <coughs> baby for us to, to watch be uh, brought into the world and we all go up and gather and see God taking that clay and molding it up into a baby and then a baby's formed. No, that's where we have to have faith in God. God doesn't have an open view of heaven for us to see right now. Because we get there, through our faith. We don't see God. Now, we talked about God's hand coming down in Bible, or in our uh, Sunday school this morning, in the men's Sunday school. We talked about the hand of God coming down and writing on the wall for the king to see and how the king trembled in fear because of that. But see, we don't see God's hand coming down and painting the flowers. I mean, you ever go to a place like, uh, uh, what's that, uh, Biltmore, Biltmore Estates, and see all the flowers that are out there and the beauty of what's been planted out there? Man planted it, but who made it grow? How can a butterfly fly around all these flowers and be such beautiful colors? Each, of, each, each and every one of them, they even may look the same color, but every one of them has a little bit of an imperfection on every single one of them yeah. to where they're all different. Just like how can God create all of us, but we all have different fingerprints and not one the same out of all the people on the earth. And those are numbers of hair on our head. Just like what the letter said that we read today. These are all things that inspire our faith. I'm not even going to get into all these people that try to prove doubt through the Bible because there's so many times I've heard where people have tried to prove the Bible wrong and they've converted right over into being a Christian because they couldn't do it. They can't do it. They're going to always try to do it, but through the Word of God, we know that they won't be able to do it. So that faith that we have each and every day carries us where we need to go for ourselves, but it's also our job to take our faith, remember they call it the leap of faith. I talk about it all the time when someone gets saved. It's not between me and that person and God for them to get saved. That is a special moment between them and God, that we're to celebrate as Christians because we've had another person join our ranks to go to God and take their spot in heaven and know that this person that we've seen and this person that we talked to, it's not anything for us to boast about that we did. It's that God let that Holy Spirit come down through us telling them about Jesus and they accept Jesus in their heart, and we know, here's somebody else going to be my neighbor in heaven. I can go right next door and say, hey, got coffee this morning. Brother Dave will be over there every morning and ask, you got coffee ready? So see, we are a family of Christians. Our sole purpose here on earth is to be ready for God or be ready for Jesus to come back and do that work while we're waiting and see how many other people that we can get to go with us. Now, Brother Fred was not here today and that Holy Spirit started moving on me through that last song we sung and I even forget, forgot to open up in prayer this morning and I kept saying it's time to open up in prayer but that Holy Spirit jumped in there and I keep on going. But you know what? God had this message. Yeah. <coughs> So, Amen. God bless this message. And this church is not a place. This, this church is for anybody that wants to come to find God, but it's really important. Let's get out there and show people that God is everywhere. Yes. When I needed God in my life the worst, 
I just knew that I could ride up in a church parking lot and things would be okay. But you know what? I didn't know not one person in that church and not one person from the church ever even come out to the parking lot and talk to. But I knew I could be close to God there because nobody ever told me God's everywhere and you can reach him everywhere. I had one man tell me that he was not saved in the church. He didn't go up to the church altar to get saved. But he had a personal relationship with God and he asked for Jesus to be in his heart. It's important for us to tell people that if you receive Jesus in your heart in your bathroom, that's acceptable to God. People are being misinformed. And all we got to do is just take the word out there too. Brother David, would you please dismiss us in prayer? Thank you, Father. Thank you for your love that you show us every day, Father. Thank you for your presence here when we came to see you, Father. Thank you for your word. Help us, Father, to take that word and use it to your glory, Father. Direct us, Father, lead us by the Holy Spirit in everything we do, Father. We give you thanks for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.